think we should also give Justin a hand because he's done this all day in those fabulous shoes and giving me beard envy. As, as Justin said, my name is PJ Haggerty. Um, I work at Engine Yard. Uh, you can find me online as Splenic. That's a whole other story. I could do a 30 minute talk on how I got that name, but we're not here to talk about that right now. So, Engine Yard. I have to mention Engine Yard because they bring me here. Um, it's a cloud application management platform that does Java, Ruby, PHP, Node.js, high performance, open access, best support team in the world. We also happen to be putting on a conference in San Francisco in August with all of these great keynoters, and you should go. And if you know you can be in San Francisco August 7th and 8th, I might be able to hook you up with a ticket. So see me about that. So a little bit about me. Um, I've been coding for the last 10 years. Uh, the last six has been as a Rubyist, and I've been happy. Um, before that, and during that, and after that, I've been a musician and producer probably since about the age of 13. So that's a long time, because I'm old. And I'm also an audiophile, and if you don't know what an audiophile is, you might know people that really like music, and they listen to a lot of music, and that's awesome. Um, but there's also people that kind of go a little bit beyond that, where they'll sit there and listen to a piece of music again and again and again, the same piece, dissect which instruments are doing what at what times, figuring out what mics they were using in the room, how many people are there, how many tracks are there actually on the individual piece, stuff like that. That's an audiophile. It's almost a disease. So in order to get into this, first we have to define what is music. Um, and I'm going to read this straight. Music is a holy place, a cathedral so majestic that we can sense the magnificence of the universe, and also a hovel so simple and private that none of us can plumb its deepest secrets. So where do we get this idea? There was a study done, and this quote is directly from that study, um, by a gentleman who wanted to see if we could use music as a healer. Um, he was kind of into homeopathy, which is, I'll mention that in a few minutes, and he felt that music could be used to cure things like cancer. Um, can music cure cancer? No. I'm not a doctor or a scientist. I'm a computer scientist, but that's different. Um, but yeah, the idea that music can help people actually came out of his studies, and he started with people with brain maladies. But before we get to that, homeopathy is the concept of natural remedies. And well, that's where this all began, that's not where it ended up. Um, so there's this guy named Don, and Don said, I work with Alzheimer's pa patients and people with brain cancers. I want to see if music can heal them. Let's find out. Um, so people were like, what, what was Don thinking? You can heal people with music? That's kind of ridiculous. But what he found was, with a certain piece of music, people started to see less cognitive dissonance. And if you don't know what that is, um, in an Alzheimer's patient, the reason why they can't remember things is because there's so much other noise inside their brain that it's basically covering it up. But he found that with a certain piece by Mozart, he could actually get them to recollect things, um, maybe for longer periods of time than they normally would, which is pretty cool. So we call it the Mozart effect. And it's just basically a set of results that said, you know, if people listen to this certain piece by Mozart, it's like KL1994 or something like that. It's about seven and a half minutes long. It's a brilliant piece of music. Um, but he saw that they could induce a short-term improvement. And short-term, depending on the patient, depending on how deeply they were affected by their disease. Um, unfortunately, it didn't really work for the people with cancer, but for the people with Alzheimer's, they were seeing hours of recollection where they, before they were seeing seconds. So in English, music makes your brain work good. That's the, that, thank you, I'm done, good night. No, um, but seriously, so, Music actually helps you recall things. It helps you focus. It helps you see where things are going. It works linearly. And, and why is that? How does that work? Well, for us, it works because it's a pretty simple jump. You have coding, and coding is math. You have music, and how many of you are musicians? Yeah, so if you're a musician and you practice regularly and you understand the way it works, it's beyond time signatures, music is math. So if coding is math, Music is math. Obviously, this whole thing was developed for coders, because why not? You know, to hell with the people with Alzheimer's. We'll solve their problems later. They're not going to remember if we were doing it or not. Anyway, um, the joke. Um, so obviously, they were totally thinking of us, because we're the coolest people in the world. Um, but in reality, they, they weren't. The focus was very much on people with brain maladies and solving their problems. 
Um, and it was really cool because they said Mozart. Mozart solves problems. So people began to look into it and do functioning, functional testing on it, A-B type testing. And they found that, you know, funny thing, Harvard and Oxford about 10 years later, which was about three or four years ago, said, well, is it just Mozart? Like, why is it this one piece of music that does so well? So they started to break it down and look at other things like other forms of music, and they said, okay, well, you like X kind of music. Let's focus on X kind of music and see if you see, get the same kind of cognitive stimulants that we're seeing with the Mozart. And as it happened, there were certain other forms of music that were working quite well for people. So that, of course, means we get the Justin Bieber effect. That's what we should call it now, right? Because Bieber is the most amazing thing in the world. I'm just going to take a moment so we can all bask in the glory of Justin Bieber. Love you, bro. Keep it real. Um, but the reality is, it's not Justin Bieber. Justin Bieber, for all intents and purposes, and I'm sorry if I offend most of you in the audience, but makes really shitty music. Um, it's really shitty, but it's popular. And the funny thing about popular music is that a whole other developmental science has looked at it and said, well, the reason why people like pop music is because it's so familiar. Because generally, you can look at the top 10 pop songs on the list, and they're probably written by the same three people using the same four chords. That's why it's popular, because it's familiar. So it really boils down to what's in the music. And what's in the music is very important. Um, it has to have emotion. It has to evoke emotion. But it also has to be played with some sort of desire. It has to be able to give you that jump and start to stretch your brain and make it more flexible, kind of like Lumosity. If you've ever heard of Lumosity, a little app on your phone where you play brains that or games that make your brain more flexible, um, which is true. Cognitive science has proved that Lumosity works. But similar to the music, it's a temporal effect. It's not permanent. So you have to play it every day. And I'm sure there's plenty of downloadable content you have to play, pay for. So let's get back to coding. So what does this have to do with coding? So a lot of us code. And even if we're pairing, we code for several hours a day by ourselves. And when you're coding by yourself, one of the key things is keeping focus. You have to keep focus constantly, or else eventually you lose the stream and you're going somewhere else. And now you've written 18 tests about a thing you're never planning on programming, and you're not sure why you did it. Um, which is cool, I guess, if you're into the whole testing thing or whatever. Sorry, Sam. But, um, but seriously, when you take the, the, the brief, small, easy step and put on a pair of headphones and start listening to music you like, you start to focus. Because your brain, the part that makes you go off and think about other things and start daydreaming and what have you, is now being kind of placated by the music. So the music becomes a background function of your brain, and the main focus is on what you're doing right now. Um, the key thing to remember is it's all temporary. Um, this boost will not be permanent. It's not like, you know, if I listen to music 18 hours a day, which I have done in my life, um, I'm suddenly fucking Einstein. It doesn't quite work that way. Um, you get a boost, it's temporary. You move on, switch different pieces of music, you get that boost again. So it's kind of, you know, it's kind of an easy, simple sine wave. You have to pay attention to it, you have to keep it up. But you have to know where to start. And the first thing you have to focus on is what's the right music? Pat Boone, in a metal mood. Thank you. Um, I'm done. Let's all program Swift to Pat Boone. Um, Sorry, that was mean. Um, finding the right music is the key. And what's the right music for everybody is different. So what does that mean? That means that we all have cultural differences. So um, a lot of people here are French. A lot of people here are from Europe. Um, there's a few Americans thrown in, uh, some Australians. I don't know. There's, there's lots of different cultures. There's lots of different things that we are brought up to believe as far as music is concerned. I, myself, um, grew up in a family that loved Bruce Springsteen. Um, which is, I know, super American, unless you actually listen to the lyrics of Bruce Springsteen and realize that he's just basically making fun of America half the time. Um, but that very much kind of determined the path I was going to take later in life. So, you know, at six and seven, it was Bruce Springsteen and the Beatles. And then, you know, as I got to realize what that root music really started to mean, it kind of became punk rock and metal and things that were, like, much more against the grain. Um, and that's the culture that I came from. My mom was a hippie. That's, <laughs> that's the things you learn is to go against the grain when your mom's a hippie. So 
what you have to do is you kind of have to start taking a look at yourself and say, okay, what did I grow up with? What am I listening to now? Where did that all come from? What floats my boat? Um, and the, the big example I can, see, I can say is if your, your mom was more of a hippie than mine was, which is totally possible, um, you might be like, you know, you might have grown up listening to stuff like The Grateful Dead and Led Zeppelin and other, you know, 60s super groups that played songs for 15 minutes and you're not really sure where they went or where they came to. And so as you grew older, you began to like fish. And for that, I'm sorry, I'm sure there's a support group for you people. Um, go to it. But, I mean, even if you like fish, when you're looking at this cognitive, cognitive push that you want to get from the music, the first step you want to take is start to find something that, uh, that is similar but instrumental. Let's take out the words. Because, I mean, let's face it, a lot of what we do is typing. So that's very physical, and you're trying to deal with the mental. So if you have someone yapping in your ear all the time about taking horses in a freezer or whatever the hell fish sings about nowadays, um, you, you want to get rid of that talking to begin to see the cognitive functioning peak. Um, so you're into fish. Uh, there's a band called Green Mint, and that's in no way a pun on marijuana at all, I'm sure. But nonetheless, they play songs similar to Fish and the Grateful Dead, but they're all instrumental. Um, if you're into, say, metal, there's a band out of, uh, I think they're like out of Norway or somewhere, because isn't that where all the metal bands are from? Um, they're, they're called Caspian, and Caspian plays not hard, it's not like super speed metal or anything, but it's called melodic metal, and there's no words, so there's none of that, you know, none of that dissonance that's going to block you from getting the cognitive boost you want from the music. So you have your basis now. You know your, you know your kind of music, you know your cultural background. So what's next? Well, more boats. You know what floats your boat, now you have to get more boats, you want an armada. Um, and the key to that is basically starting to interact. And I'll talk more about the interaction. But what you want to do is, once you find a, a sound that you like, a, a genre that you appreciate, you want to start looking at other people in that same genre or maybe something that's you know, very tangential to it and start forming more opinions about the music. As you get used to this, you can start bringing back in the lyrical music because the instrumental is necessary. Um, and I, I will say this. You'll never go wrong with classical or jazz. They're almost always instrumental and almost always in a way that's syncopated to your brain. Um, that's why you know, a lot of people say, oh, jazz is simple and classical is hard. Um, I defy you to, see, to play a jazz song. Listen to some Charlie Parker. There is nothing simple about that. And yet it's so angular that you find yourself falling into it and it being processed by the back of your mind and your focus just skyrockets. So one of the things that Bruce Springsteen said, because, again, he's kind of awesome, um, he was at this little, tiny little conference in Texas called South by South something, um, keynoting it, and he said, you know, we should embrace everything that sounds right to our ears. And that's the key. There's going to be music always, always, that uh, kind of doesn't hit with us. Um, for me, it's pretty much anything played on Top 40 radio because you do eventually get sick of those four chords written by those three people. And God, if I ever hear another Katy Perry song, I might just shoot myself in the head. But seriously, like you know what you like to hear. Um, so focus on that. Move with it. Listen to him. He's the boss. It's not just a clever title. Um, and get more into stuff. So here's a warning. Um, you might start listening to things that you don't necessarily think are kosher. Um, things that you think might be a little bit like way out of your boundaries that you never expected to find. Um, things that, you know, for some reason just click with you. Um, I was never a big hip hop guy. I just wasn't. I don't know why. But um, I found that when I was doing the research on this over a few years, like there were certain songs that for some reason I just can't get rid of them. I just love these songs. And one of them is. Uh, a mashup of Linkin Park and Jay-Z doing Encore and Numb together at the same time. And I'm like, I love this song. I don't know why. It's actually kind of horrible. And I don't listen to Jay-Z, and I don't listen to Linkin Park. Yet when you put the two together, it's like chocolate and peanut butter. It's like magic. And you know, so you'll find yourself listening to things that you might find morally offensive, and yet you're listening to them anyway.
because they're floating your boat. So to way overpress this boat metaphor, look into getting a different boat. The cognitive boost you're looking for is only going to work for so long if you just continue to listen to one genre of music or two genre of mu music that are tangentially connected. So how do you start looking into a, getting a different boat? Um, Josh said very aptly, like, Ruby has one of the best communities in the world. And if you want to, you know, if you ever want to ask anybody a question about Ruby, it's easy as all get out to do. So I would suggest you do the same thing to find your new music. Um, used to be, I used to use this thing called Turntable FM, which I know is not, never made it to Europe, and they canceled it, and it's like a different product now that's much stupider. Um, but there's this thing called Plug DJ, and what Plug DJ does is you get four or five people, and you get together, and everybody's a DJ, so you create a little playlist, and you just take turns. And that's great, because you know, you're really into this, you know, this fish song. I'm sorry, this therapy. Um, and then someone comes out and plays something by like a super hardcore band from New York called Outspoken, and you're like, I've never heard this before. But wait a minute here. This is not so bad. I kind of like this. So you know, you make a little note or you favorite it in the app or whatever, and you find that you know playing music with your friends is a great way to find out about more stuff that you never even knew you liked before. Um, quick note: This is not the first time I did this talk. The first time I did it was at Cascadia Ruby. And shortly afterwards, this came up by one of the people that was in the audience, musicforprogramming.com. Um, and the brilliance of it is these are playlists developed at first just by Ruby programmers, but then other programmers were looking at it and saying, hmm, this is pretty interesting. I want to I get in on this. So people would make playlists and post them, which prior to that, we were just doing through gists and stuff like that up on GitHub which works just fine. I mean, I, I've shared the playlist that I was listening to while I developed this talk several times, and people think it's really cool. Um, and I mean, to me, any way you're going to share with other people is even better. But to actually formalize it and put up a website, it, to me, I was a little bit honored. I was like, I made that guy do that. Um, before we go on, safety first. We had a big talk about this around lunchtime. So, if you see me when I'm walking around here in Europe because I'm traveling, I will be wearing earbuds. I hate earbuds. They are very bad for you. I listen to my music extremely loud, which being a drummer, I probably shouldn't even be able to hear any of you right now, but I can. I'm a lucky guy. But uh, I highly recommend over-the-ear quality headphones. Will you spend more money for them? Yes, you will, because they are quality headphones. Sennheiser makes great headphones. Sony makes great, great headphones. Beats. They look great, and you look fantastic as you're walking around with your gigantic white headphones that don't sit on your ears right and have way too much bass in them and are slowly degrading all of the lower tones in your ears. But yeah, I mean, like you look good. It says B on the side of your head. There can't be anything wrong with that. And Skull Candy? Don't even get me started on Skull Candy. If you're shopping for headphones at Hot Topic, you're already doing it wrong. Um, so one of the questions that comes up is, well, isn't you know, putting on a pair of headphones, isn't that isolating? Like, you're not pairing anymore. You're not working together. You're segregating yourself from everybody else. So you can just be in your little code world, which, again, I mean, we kind of already do that anyway. Nonetheless, I'm, I'm going to share a little story here. It's a story time. Um, so my previous job, I worked in an office, which is something I never want to do again. Um, and I paired with this guy, my Ruby mentor, a great guy named Mark Joseph. Um, and we musically did not get along. But code-wise, like, psh, man, we could work, to, we could kick stuff out all day long. Um, but we were isolated for a while, so we started to say, all right, well, here's what we're going to do. The machine that we're working on, no longer our laptops or our phones, the machine that we are working on will hold the playlist. It's going to pull from both of our iTunes and just throw it together, and what you get is what you get. No one's allowed to complain. And what we found was, because I listen to more aggressive forms of music, um, in some places more complicated, like math rock kind of stuff, and that's not accessible to the average listener. Um, and he listens to, for lack of a better term, music played by very small girls with very large acoustic guitars. Like, every, everything he had was like Jewel and Ingrid Michaelson and like very small girls, very large guitars. Very talented, but very similar sounding after about 20 songs in. 
But what, what, what I found was, you know, he began looking at me every time one of my songs came on and being like, you know what, this is, this is all right. This is good. We're not isolated anymore. We're sharing our music together, and that's awesome. So a note on sharing. This is more for the Americans in the audience. I highly recommend sharing your music as much as possible. I don't care what the Record Industry Association of America says because they don't really have a purpose in the music world except to make money, and that's not even what people make music for, so screw them. Um, but share as much as you can, and there's lots of ways to do that. You can make a mixtape, not literally. I mean, I know that like in Brooklyn and Williamsburg, that's really cool these days. Like, oh, I made a cassette tape, it's so awesome. And I know that the, the mixtape has a connotation from back in the day of uh, kind of being like, oh man, I love this person so much, but they don't recognize me. How can I, how can I solve this problem? I will make them a mixtape. It has songs that mean so much to me, and it probably means nothing to them. It means so much to me, and that way they'll know I love them and I could ask them on a date. That never works, by the way. For those of you who missed the mixtape era, sorry, that never worked. So mixtapes, mix CDs, playlists, it's not going to get you a date. It's just going to probably make you look pretty bad. But what we can do is we can make playlists and share them. We can use musicforprogrammers.com and put stuff up. We can uh, you know, make gists of songs that we were listening to while we were doing something and share it that way. Um, other things that you can do to benefit from the cognitive uh, push that we're all looking for to make us better coders is take a break. Play your own guitar. Just stop what you're doing. Stop your playlist. Put your headphones on. Take them off. Back on. Play something completely different. And just not code for five minutes. Just listen to that song for however long it is, five, ten minutes. Listen to a couple songs in that in that field that's so different from what you were just listening to, then go back to what you were listening to and start coding again. And you'll see, you're like, hmm, all right, well, this is pretty cool. Now I'm back to ground zero, and I'm starting on that upswing again. Awesome. Um, you can also do it yourself. I love putting pictures of me in my presentation because I love me. Um, but th this is me playing with the original uh, RailsConf band, uh, which is Ron Evans and Chad Fowler, and I'm playing the drums there. And there's a couple guys playing guitar. And it was like uh, an instantly put together thing that happened because someone wanted a band to do a Tonight Show style keynote at RailsConf. So yeah, that happened. We got to play the Doctor Who theme in Mario, so everybody was really happy with it. Um, but it's funny because it's one of the things that brought us together as coders, even though it had nothing to do with code. And we all you know, thought a little bit more about things while we were doing that. I mean, for those of you who are musicians, you know that a lot of times when you're playing, when you're playing the instrument that you've been playing for so many years, your mind starts to go somewhere else while you're playing because it's become automatic. You know, I've been playing this song for two and a half years. I totally know exactly where I'm going. I wonder if I'm going to go shopping later. How's the World Cup going? Man, I'm totally missing that because of practice. These guys are jerks. Um, but yeah, you start to see things differently when you do it yourself. Um, there's another band I got to be a part of at Rails Israel where the band consisted of Boris on accordion, I'm not in that picture. I'm playing the drums in the background. And the guy right here, this is Jan. Jan makes music with JavaScript. He plugs his computer directly into the PA and live codes while the band plays. And he sets the tone, and we follow him. Um, on a projector is him, his code being done live. And it's really, really impressive to me. Um, so. Now we've made the ultimate jump. We've got a cognitive boost because of the music that we're listening to. We understand how to share it. We've started to do it ourselves, and then we're learning to do it with code. And there's lots of other things. Um, I know there was a talk, at, at, there were actually two lightning talks at a conference in London called Bacon, um, where people did wrote code that would then be generated, and it would create certain music based on what people were doing in the apps on their phone or sending through a website or something like that. And it would keep stats of you know, how many people played a C note, how many people are playing the drums right now, stuff like that. And it was like a really interesting way. And everybody in the crowd got into it. And then we looked at the code, and it was that much more amazing. Because, I mean, sometimes it gets dry when there's no music. So the key is unlocking. We talked about boats a lot. Now we're going to talk about keys. Um, but I mean, J.K. Rowling kind of put it nicely in the mouth of Dumbledore when she said, music, a magic beyond all we do here at Hogwarts. Um, and it is kind of an interesting thing because music, I mean, like, 
Music and code are so similar that you wonder, where, do, where exactly do they come from? When you decide to code something, where does that get generated from? It's just a little single idea in your brain. And I posit that the more music you listen to, the more you focus and the better your code's going to be. So you're using that same part of the brain to do more things and make things more amazing. So I have some resources here. Um, Don Campbell was the guy who did the homeopathic original Mozart effect, um, which again, he wanted people to unlock their creative spirits and I don't know, do yoga and stuff. Um, F.H. Rauscher wrote kind of the rewrite on that so it was less homeopathic and there was definitely more cognitive science involved. Um, B. E. Rideau and his group did the effect of um, music on spatial performance. Coding is spatial performance. You're doing it physically. You're using your brain, but you're also recognizing where things are supposed to go. Um, I mean, what we do, especially in, in Ruby, everything's an object. It's not a physical object, it's an object in your mind. Um, you have to reason with it spatially. You have to understand where it fits into the giant bunch of objects that you have. Um, there's also William Price Phillips, uh, the University Forum on the Mozart Effect, and some other journals, and feel free to take pictures of that. So now for the thing that I've been kind of dreading this whole talk. Um, so how many of you saw or met at some point uh, a guy named Jim Wyrick? Jim Wyrick was kind of one of the most amazing people in our community. Um, he was a big influence on me. He had the ability to humbly come up on stage every single time and have this affect of just everything was brand new and everything was awesome. Um, and unfortunately, he passed away a few months ago. Um, and it was a big blow for me because he was a good friend. Um, but beyond that, we came together. I met him at the first ever Ruby conference I went to, which was actually RailsConf in Las Vegas. And there was a jam session. It was like, OK, I don't know Ruby yet. I've been doing this for a month. But I know this. I can play the drums. I can go talk to these people on that level. Um, and he was there, and he picked up this like old 1942 Gibson guitar. And I'm like, oh, cool. Santa Claus is going to play the guitar. Um, because I had no respect for anyone at that point in time. Um, <laughs> that's actually the same day I met DHH, and I was like, and who is he? Who the fuck do I care? Um, I learned later to be more, more respectful to people. But uh, he just played amazingly. So um, when I did the CFP for this, and they picked this talk for me to do, I appreciated it. And um, I don't know if it was Fabian or Ferdinand who said, do you think you could play a song? at the end of the talk. And I said, oh, OK, let me see. So I actually wrote a song in tribute to my friend Jim. So give me a minute here, and we're going to make this happen, theoretically. This song will not give you a cognitive boost. I'm not that good. Hello world, it was code but so much more, with rake and drones, make our day, told you I wasn't good, a humble man, with a smile for everyone, a voice brighter than the sun, you taught us work was fun. You sang of a lisp And you wrote the ruby song With a uke always at the ready You'd never steer us wrong You spoke of connaissance And while I still can't say it right Your ideas stay with us through every coding day and night And when you left We all commented your last commit But all that's left to say is goodbye friend And hello world Thanks.